Hi folks, wanted to drop you a little bit of information on uh, Plato's Apology, provide you some context, and maybe identify some questions and some ideas that you should be thinking about ahead of our class discussion. So the first thing I'd say is that this piece, like a lot of the pieces we read, is really best read out loud. For one, uh, again, reading out loud allows your ears to work with your eyes to help your brain uh, identify really important ideas and to untangle sometimes some archaic syntax uh, or complicated ideas. So read this one out loud. The other reason it's good to read out loud is because ostensibly this is what Socrates said to his jurors, his, the 500 jurors at his trial, and so this he actually spoke this. So read it out loud and listen to it, and as you're listening to it, you know, uh, try to think about what it would have been like to hear this as a juror. Um, so the first thing I guess I'll t tell you here is a little bit about Socrates. He's, be he's come to be the kind of the, the icon of philosophy. Uh, when people think of philosophy, they think of Socrates or they think of Plato. Uh, Socrates uh, was in the military as a young man, uh, served in three wars, apparently fought valiantly, was honored for his valor, uh, and then spent the rest of his life kind of wandering Athens, wandering the marketplace, wandering the gymnasium. And he was well known for talking with anybody who was willing to talk with him. And although he was regarded as a teacher at the time, uh, he rejected that label and, and he rejected it for a couple of reasons. One is there were teachers at the time, they were called the sophists. And they were these guys that would travel around and, for a fee, would teach people how to speak persuasively. They would teach them rhetoric. And uh, Socrates rejected their teachings outright because Socrates believed that all they were really doing was teaching people how to, how to use language skillfully in order to manipulate people. And Socrates believed that, no, you use language as a way of working with other people to discover what's true, not to manipulate people into believing something, but to uh, use language in order to build uh, bridges to discover knowledge. Um, and so, and, and then the other reason that he rejected the, the label of teacher is that he believed he didn't teach anything. You know, Socrates, um, as you'll read in the Apology, makes the claim that he doesn't know much of anything, and nor does anyone else, and the things that people think they know are not actually things that they know. And so Socrates didn't actually teach uh, content so much as teach a method, uh, what's been termed now the Socratic method. The Socratic method of asking questions about very basic ideas and then asking further questions about the responses to those original questions. The interesting thing about Socrates is that even though, or one of the interesting things about Socrates is that even though he is regarded as kind of the, the icon of philosophy, he didn't write anything down. Everything that we know about Socrates comes from primarily from Plato, uh, some of the plays of Aristophanes, Xenophane, uh, or Xenophon, um, and uh, so everything that we know about him is secondhand, it, it comes to a second hand, and yet Clearly, he has been arguably the most influential thinker to have existed uh, in Western civilization. Um, a little bit of background on the Apology, as you, I'll, I'll let you read that in your book. Um, the, the Apology was Socrates' answer to the charges being brought against him by his prosecutors. Um, and the charges being brought against him by his prosecutors um, are uh, impiety, you know, worshipping the wrong gods, essentially, and um, harming children, which is interesting because if you think about, you know, this is 2,500 years ago, and clearly um, the charges being leveled against him are similar to the kinds of charges that we find our own politicians leveling against controversial figures today. You know, oh, what about the children? We have to think about the children. What you're doing and the information you're spreading is damaging to the children. 
Uh, and by claiming that he's wor worshiping the false gods, they're essentially saying, and on top of it all, you're a bad person. So, you know, we can probably see analogous uh, instances in our own times of people being brought forward to answer those kinds of ambiguous charges. That something about the ways that they speak and the ideas that they have um, are, uh, are somehow dangerous, controversial. Um, now, the way that Socrates conducted his life that resulted in him having these charges brought against him um, began with a, not a rumor, um, but a declaration that the oracle at Delphi made. Uh, Seraphim, uh, one of Socrates' um, fellow citizens, went to the oracle at Delphi and said, um, hey, who's the, who's the wisest out there? Is there anybody wiser in the world than Socrates, and the Oracle of Delphi says, no, there is nobody wiser than that. And so when Seraphim comes back and shares that with Socrates, um, Socrates said, well, that can't be. I, I, don't, I don't know anything. How could, I, how could there be no one wiser than me when I don't consider myself to be wise at all? And so, you know, that is ostensibly the impetus for Socrates then going around and talking to different people and asking them questions to see if they know something that he doesn't know. And so he would, uh, as it says in the Apology, the, the, in the excerpt from our book, he went and he talked to politicians, he talked to poets, he talked to educators, he talked to artists. And the idea was, again, according to Socrates, you know, this person purports to know something about art or poetry or politics or truth or education, I'm going to ask them questions and see what they know, and if it turns out that they know something that I don't know, then I can go back to the Oracle of Delphi and say, hey, you were wrong, I'm not the one. There are people who are wiser than me, I've met them, they, they know things that I don't know. Well, the problem is that Socrates would ask somebody a question about something very basic. I would, he would ask, for example, a politician, what is justice? And um, the politician would answer, and then Socrates would look back and say, hmm, now that's a very interesting answer, but it raises more questions for me. So let me pose to you these questions. And kind of around and around and around this would go until ultimately um, the person that Socrates is talking to winds up in the same position that Euthyphro winds up in, and that is recognizing that they didn't know all that they thought they knew. Um, sometimes, though, they don't, they don't come to that recognition. They sort of stubbornly hold on to this false belief that they have. And for Socrates, that, was, that made some sense, or it helped, make, it helped him make sense of what the oracle at Delphi said. Because the oracle at Delphi said, there is none wiser than Socrates. And Socrates realizes, well, I'm not wise. I've talked to these other guys who claim to be wise, who claim to know things, but clearly after asking them questions, they don't actually know what they claim to know. And the difference between them and me is that I know I don't know. They think they know. They think they know the truth, but clearly my questioning of them revealed to me that they don't actually know what they claim they know. They, they believe in a lie or they believe in something illogical, and yet the fact that they're choosing to continue to believe that and continue to believe that that's true makes them less wise than me because I'm not duped into it. I'm not, I'm not accepting that. You can probably imagine how unpopular uh, it was for a kind of scrawny... Uh, shaggy-haired, bald, well, balding, but kind of scraggly-haired, um, slovenly guy to be asking people in positions of authority very basic questions about what they claim to have authority over, and very publicly asking them these questions, and in the process of asking them these questions, revealing that the people who claim to have authority don't actually have the right to that authority that they claim they have. Uh, that the poet doesn't know as much about the ideas as he claims he does, that the politician doesn't know as much about justice as he claims he does. Um, and, and that's... It's a, he, Socrates was an irritant in that way. He was a social irritant. He called himself a gadfly, a horsefly, somebody who kind of buzzed around people's heads and then kind of stung them every once in a while or bit them every once in a while. 
painfully showing people that you know you don't you're not all that you don't know all that you think you do. So, at any rate, uh, Socrates is uh, brought to trial. He's brought to trial primarily by a guy named Miletus. Not a lot is known about him, um, but what is known is in a number of places, including one of Socrates, uh, in in one of Plato's pieces, uh, Miletus is described as having a beak uh, and a beard which is ill-grown. So he's kind of described as being an ugly guy. Miletus was probably a religious fanatic um, and probably upset about the questions that Socrates uh, asked people about their knowledge of the gods, about religious authority, um, and didn't like that, probably tossed in the corruption of the youth charge uh, just to kind of rile people up and get them going on that. Uh, Miletus was also a poet. Socrates did not like the poets. Um, because the poets wrote poetry about myths, about the stories, and Socrates uh, was much more uh, interested in learning the nature of things. Not the nature of things according to the stories, but the nature of things according to logic and observation. Um, So at any rate, so Miletus brings Socrates to trial and levels these charges against him, and you can read the excerpt in our book on the Apology and kind of follow the way that Socrates makes his response to Miletus' charges. And if you want to, I put a link on our course schedule that would allow you access to the Apology in its entirety, and and you can read that. Um, The thing that I would want you to think about, though, are the questions and the ideas that uh, the Apology sort of puts in front of us. One is the relative value of knowledge versus ignorance. Um, Socrates makes his... Socrates defends himself by saying, you know, it's not that it's not that I'm spreading bad ideas. It's not that I've um, it's it's not that I'm corrupting the youth by filling their heads full of uh, bad ideas. I'm simply demonstrating or or showing, revealing the false beliefs that are being taught to children, or I'm I'm demonstrating the false beliefs that people have that they've been taught. Um, and so it's not that I'm actually filling them up with something that's corrupting, it's I'm exposing, I'm exposing something that's not true. Um, and it, this raises an interesting question, I think, for us, which is, we, we claim, I assume, I would make the claim for myself, and I assume that most of you would make the claim, or perhaps all of you, we would claim that we value the truth more than lies. And we would probably claim that it's better to know and to have knowledge than to be ignorant. And yet, at the same time, I think we would all admit that we've found ourselves similarly irritated as Socrates' uh, fellow citizens were by him, by people who exposed our own ignorance and people who challenge our ideas and put us in a position where suddenly an idea that we have or a position we've been defending, we can suddenly see is not the good position that we thought it was, or was is not the true knowledge that we thought it was. And yet, typically, we don't welcome that. Uh, when somebody challenges us, we tend to, and challenges an idea that we're offering, or challenges a claim that we're making, people typically respond defensively. They resist learning that what they think they know is not actually something that they know. They resist accepting that things they regard as true are actually false. And in other words, our initial reaction oftentimes is to kind of cling to a lie, which is interesting because, again, we say that we want the truth and we claim that we are pursuing truth and we claim that we resent it when people lie to us and we claim that we want to have true knowledge. And yet, typically we don't respond to people who reveal our false thinking to us by, by, you know, grasping their hand and saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you revealed to me how bad my thinking is and how stupid those ideas were and how, how much my whole belief system is based on a bunch of lies. Thank you so much. That is not the way that we typically react. And it's not the way that Socrates' fellow citizens reacted to him. Again, it's not that he told them the truth. It's that he revealed to them that what they were thinking wasn't true. Uh, and they resented it so much that they put him on trial and eventually killed him. So, so one question I think I would 
ask you to consider is, why is it that we value the truth uh, more than lies? And, and if we do, why is it that we tend to react defensively when somebody, uh, when somebody says to us that the things that we think are true are actually lies and that something other than what we believe is the truth? Uh, why isn't it that we don't, why do we react defensively to that kind of a, a claim instead of saying, oh gosh, I'm curious, tell me more. What is it that I believe that's false? Okay, so that's be sort of the first area I'd want you to think about. The second thing I'd want you to think about is the power of ideas. Because again, Socrates is being brought on trial because the belief is, or the, the claim is, that the ideas that he's spreading and the method that he's using is somehow dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous not just to children, it's corrupting not just to children, but it's also corrupting to society. You know, and Socrates would say, all I'm doing is talking, and really all I'm doing is asking questions and offering him ideas. And yet the response of his, um, the response of his fellow citizens is what you're doing is actually dangerous, it's, it's, it's potentially harmful. And, and so I'd, I'd want you to think a little bit about that, and you're going to have to think about that to complete the thought experiment on page 17 of your book, which asks you about dangerous ideas. Are any ideas dangerous? Now, as you're thinking about that, I want you to be really careful to distinguish between an idea and a thing. Uh, uh, an idea is uh, a mental phenomenon. Uh, it's a, uh, having an idea is a mental event. But a thing is a material uh, phenomenon. Uh, event is a material phenomenon. So one of the questions you're being asked is, are there any ideas that are worth dying for, any ideas that are worth killing for? And oftentimes I'll have students respond to that question by saying, well, yes, I would die for my family. Well, your family's not an idea. The, now, family can be an idea. There is this idea called family, but your family is just one manifestation of that idea. Your family itself is a thing. Those are real people. So we, you want to make sure that you're focused in on ideas, mental events, things that can be communicated from one person to another. Um, and to think really carefully about that. What, are ideas dangerous? And if so, what kinds of ideas would be dangerous? And in order to think about that, you're probably going to have to think about first about what exactly it means to call something dangerous. What is danger? Uh, and do ideas fall within the realm of things that are dangerous? All right? Uh, and, and also think about, think really carefully about those last two questions in the thought experiment. Are there ideas that are worth killing for? I know that we would probably all say that I would, you know, I think it's worthwhile to kill somebody in order to protect myself or to protect my family. Uh, I think that there are certainly many of us who would say that there are things that are worth dying for. I would die to save my family. But again, those aren't ideas. Those are people. So you want to think about, you know, is an idea like justice or equality or fairness or democracy, are those ideas that are worth sacrificing a life for, yours or somebody else's? The other thing to think about when uh, considering the Apology is the relationship that Socrates implies toward the end of the excerpt in our book, uh, the relationship between the mind and the body. Socrates, Socrates makes this claim that um, the people who are bringing these charges against him can't actually do any harm to him. Uh, that they're actually harming themselves more than they're harming him. He says, look, you can take away somebody's civil rights, you can even kill somebody. But that's not actually harming them, and, and that's going to seem a little perplexing on the surface, but what Socrates is driving at is that for him, he believed that the true nature of the person, the real person, is something that's in the body. The person, the person has a body, but the person is not a body. If that, I hope that, think about that distinction there. It's not that, um, it's not that the person is the body. It's that there's a person inside the body, and the body is kind of this this casing or this shell that uh, the person inhabits while here on Earth. And um, Socrates would probably call this not necessarily the mind, but the soul. And he would say that the essence of the person is this thing that is non-material, and it's inside the body. Uh, and so when you when you do something to control the body like kill it or jail it, you're not actually harming the real person, you're just harming the, the, the body of the person. And 
Um, what's interesting here is um, something that your book talks about earlier that's really fundamental probably to Socrates, but clearly to Plato, and we'll talk about him uh, in a couple of weeks. And it's this idea that Socrates says that there are these ideas like truth or justice, equality, courage, and those ideas are unchanging, and they, they are not dependent on any one person or any one person giving, uh, give, verbalizing them. Uh, for their existence. They don't depend on anything. They exist unchanging, independent of any individual person or any collection of people. And this will become really clear as we go into the metaphysics of Plato, but for now think, think about what Socrates is saying. Socrates is saying there are these ideas that are constant and they are eternal and they are, they are, um, they're not dependent on any of the things that happen in the material world. And, and what Socrates would say one step beyond that is, and if you think about things that are in the material world, they're in a constant state of change, unlike those unchanging eternal ideas. The things on earth, the material things on earth, are in a constant state of change. Things are growing, things are dying, things are decaying, things are constantly changing. Bodies are born, bodies die. Um, but the ideas remain unchanged forever. And... Um, What's important there is that Socrates says, and because it's possible for the real person existing in the body to access those eternal unchanging ideas that exist outside of the material world, there must be some sort of a relationship between the real uh, non-material person, the soul or the mind that exists in the body and those eternal unchanging ideas. There must be some sort of a relationship between those two things. And, and so again, here's something for you to be thinking about. When you think about who you are and you think about what, who a person is and you think about somebody's sense of self and somebody's identity, soul, if you want to put it in religious terms, what is that? And where is that? And what is the relationship of that thing to one's physical body. Are we more than just a body? Um, and if so, how do we know that? And if we are, what's the relationship between that thing and these eternal unchanging ideas, if those eternal unchanging ideas even exist? This is where Socrates and Plato both get into a little bit of mysticism um, in this belief that there are these eternal unchanging ideas. But nevertheless, it's something um, for us to think about, this idea that if we have something other than a body that is a fundamental part of who we are as our experiencing selves. What is that? All right. Which takes me to um, the last or second to the last thing that I want you to think about. And that is the relationship between ideas and wisdom and the eternal. Um, and, you know, Socrates talks a lot about wisdom. And for Socrates, wisdom is different from knowledge, and it's different from passion, and it's different from a belief. And, and you should think about that a little bit. What exactly do we mean when we say that someone is wise? You know, not everybody who's knowledgeable is wise. So what exactly do we mean when we say that someone is wise? And what is wisdom? And how does one come by wisdom? And what does it look like when somebody um, sits in wisdom, is, lives with wisdom? Uh, and, and I'm asking you this because what Socrates claims in his defense, and his apology, is that the people who are accusing them have their priorities really screwed up, that they are very concerned on material world circumstances, and they're very concerned with uh, status, uh, and that they're really focused on the wrong things in life, money in particular. And what Socrates claims is that the wise person knows better than that, that the wise person knows that one's life should be spent um, seeking out the truth, pursuing knowledge, um, and that the unwise person is the person who allows himself to be distracted from that proper course. Right? So think about that a little bit. What is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? What is it, what's the difference between being knowledgeable and being wise? 
All right? So think about those things and think about who the people in, in your life um, think, who are that you, who you would regard as wise people. Who are the wise people around us today? All right? And what is it that makes them wise? And what's the difference between being wise and being knowledgeable? So think about all this stuff. Go ahead, take a look at the apology. Read through it really carefully. Again, read through it out loud and bring your fantastic questions and insights and thoughts to class. All right, see you then.